Hello, everyone. Welcome back, uh, or welcome maybe for the first time to Adventures Through the Mind. I am your host, as always, James Abugesso. Uh Thanks for tuning in to this podcast featuring the cutting edge of interdisciplinary discussions on psychedelic culture, um, or at least uh, that's what I'm shooting for. Hopefully you agree. Um, this is a special episode. I mean, every episode is special, honestly, because I love doing what I'm doing and it feels great to do it. Um, but it's special in the sense that today's guest is actually um, quite a significant person insofar as the progress or the progression of psychedelic science over the last 10 years. Um, Dr. Robin Carhart Harris. Let me read his bio. I, I mean, many of you Many of you already know who he is if you're into the psychedelic culture thing, um, but I'll read his bio for good measure and, you know, of course, for respect. Dr. Robin Carhart Harris heads the psychedelic research group within the Center for Psychiatry at Imperial College London, where he has designed a number of functional brain imaging studies with psilocybin, LSD, MDMA, and DMT, plus a clinical trial of psilocybin for treatment-resistant depression. He has over 50 published papers in peer-reviewed scientific journals, two of which were ranked in the top 100 most impactful academic articles of 2016. Robin's research has featured in major national and international media, and he has given a popular TED Talk. Much of what uh, we in the sort of psychedelic culture or psychedelic uh, research culture or psychedemia people, either deep in the academy or in the underground, somewhere in the middle, um, much of what we understand about how psychedelics are affecting the brain insofar as the fMRI studies are, you know, largely um, to be thanked. Dr. Robin Carhart Harris is largely to be, to be thanked for a lot of those studies. So it was pretty exciting for me to have him on the show, especially the uh, long um, sort of effort that went into to catching this man who is very, very busy and getting him on the show. So very happy to have him. Um, now, before we get into it, I, I have a couple of things I want to mention. Um, one of which is that uh, I feel a little embarrassed about the first sentence, <laughs> essentially, that I present in this interview because I used the wrong word. I was a little nervous. I was kind of reading off a script, honestly, and I said um, circum, circ, circumbiguate or something like that. Circum. Anyways, I meant to say circ. What the hell did I mean to say? Circumambulate, um, which is a term uh, which is like sort of a religious encircling of a sacred object for purposes, you know, religious purposes or spiritual purposes. But anyways, I kind of want to say that. I mean, like I come off as, you know, I'm very self-confident. My self-esteem is pretty good to quote blind boy. I have a, I have an internal locus of self-evaluation, which is, you know, pretty good, but I get embarrassed um, and I get shy. And it's, I just, I just want to admit that. Uh, the other thing is that there's a couple points where an alarm goes off, a phone rings, we take a break, we take a little bit of a pee break. I took a pee break. Robin, uh, Dr. Carhart Harris, uh, he went off to, you know, make the phone stop ringing. So there's a jump in the conversation. You know, normally I don't do that. It's like uncut. Um, but just to save you the three minutes of waiting uh, for us to return to the mic, we've done that. And the last thing is that it jumps in pretty quickly uh, to the foundation of Robin's interest and the development of the entropic brain uh, model. So it asks you to show up pretty quickly to sort of a complex web of history and influences before it moves into a much more conversational style uh, than I typically get up to here at the podcast. The The rapport between uh, Dr. Robert <laughs> I feel so awkward just saying it over and over again like that, but I'm going to say it. The rapport between Dr. Robin Carhart Harris and I um, went really well, and I feel really good about it, and I think you're going to like it. Um, it's one of the reasons why this interview is so long, you know, uh, you know, easily 45 minutes longer than the average uh, than the average interview here at the show. That's essentially it. Um, yeah, that's essentially it. I hope you enjoy this interview. Um Big thanks to my patrons on Patreon, uh, whose names, some of which, whose names are listed on the screen here, and uh, others of which are not having their names listed on the screen here. But um, either way, I thank all of you for your support uh, in the show. 
and uh, I would like to invite others who are not yet patrons to check out my Patreon page and maybe become patrons. Um, jameswjesser.com forward slash support can point you to Patreon, to PayPal, to crypto donations, um, as well as other options, buying my books, buying some t-shirts, buying some limited edition blotter art, of which I still have 35 of 100. So if you would like some, uh, please head over and check it out. Free shipping on that blotter art. Um, yeah, so jameswjessa.com forward slash support would really appreciate you throwing a little money uh, into the podcast, throwing a little, uh, you know, uh, socially acknowledged universal value marker uh, into the investments that go along with the podcast. Appreciate it. Appreciate keeping these bright lights on. That's it. Thank you for tuning in to this uh, long intro. Uh, enjoy this interview between myself and Dr. Robin Carhart Harris. Dr. Robin Carhart Harris, welcome to Adventures Through the Mind. Pleased to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you for being on the show. It's been sort of like a long process of like, hey, uh, would you like to be on the show? No answer for a while. Okay, get it. He's a very busy guy. <laughs> and then all of a sudden there was a response and I was like, if you're still into it, and then here we are. So very excited about it. Right, yeah, happy to be here. Uh, now I'd love to go you know, pretty deep in pretty deep into the neuroscience um, on this episode today, sort of getting it, pardon the term, but uh, getting what psychedelics do in the brain straight from the horse's mouth uh, in a way. Um, and I would like to do so, um, you know, looking at the specific science of what it is that you're discovering, as well as having that somewhat couched in your entropic brain model so that we sort of come to discover a greater understanding of what that model is um, by, you know, kind of like back referencing the model as we talk about the science, um, which of course would mean that we'd need to start with a sort of general idea of the entropic brain. So if you can give us that sort of general overview and over the course of the interview, we'll get a, a greater understanding of it as we uh, circumambugate the psychedelic experience. Yeah. Yeah, gosh. Uh, well, um, it's difficult to know when exactly the idea began. Um, and so perhaps the easiest way to, um, to answer that is to say what, what inspired me. Um, and um, uh, a particular um, neuroscientist, British neuroscientist, a, a guy called Carl Friston, um, had a big influence on, on my thinking around the idea so he's 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 actually a, you know an extremely prolific uh, scientist he's the most cited uh, neuroscientists in in the world i think currently and um, he's responsible for something that he calls the free energy principle which is a very grand uh, all encompassing theory and formalism of of how uh, life works really um uh and of course you know the brain is very much at, at the center of his thinking but it is a, a theory that now um mostly through collaborators but you know he very much opens the door to this uh is, is a way of kind of explaining living systems you know that self-organize that um tend to resist uh, the second law of thermodynamics, which is that systems tend towards disorder. Um, and uh, as, as we see when we look around the living world, um, we see that uh, a lot of systems don't obey that principle, mm. at least for the period in which um, they are alive. When they die, they certainly do and degrade in the normal way. But there's this interesting thing that happens when a when a living system is living, which is that it resists uh, uh, that principle. And, and so I guess through um, uh, familiarizing myself and, and really being inspired by reading Carl's work uh, around, gosh, where are we? Um, there were a couple of seminal papers around 2002, 2005 that were sort of precursors to what then became uh, um the free energy principle. Um, I think one was a theory of cortical responses. I can't re really remember the other one, but, you know, very kind of um, very detailed, very long um, papers that I remember, you know, really 
um, uh, uh, reading in a, in a lot of, you know, with a lot of effort, actually, um, to try and digest it. But what I was picking up, um, I suppose, was was the writings of, of a physicist, which is what uh, how Carl trained. Um, uh, he has a degree, I think, from Cambridge in, in physics and then um, went on to um, to do medicine and psychiatry. And um, but, uh, you know, this way of thinking about the brain from a, um, the perspective of someone, I guess, trained in classical physics. And, um, and and so, you know, notions of order and chaos were very much there in his um in his thinking and and they were they just naturally were coming into my mind as I was tackling a uh, a specific question um, which is how do psychedelics work in the brain and just thinking about it theoretically and around a similar time starting to get our first bits of data um, uh, looking in the human brain on on psychedelics. And one of the findings that we saw early on when we were looking at psilocybin, magic mushrooms, and, and how they alter brain function um, was that uh, the distribution of, of blood flow um, changes and, um, and we were seeing these, these decreases in blood flow in certain regions that are some of the regions are normally um, quite heavily perfused at baseline, so receive a particularly large amount of blood flow under normal default conditions. Um, a little bit of a hint there as to the network that I'm mm -hmm. thinking of, the mm -hmm. default mode network. Yes, uh, you know, a, a particular network in the brain that is extraordinarily uh, active and metabolically hungry and, and, and connected and a lot of things about this network that kind of single it out as being a bit special, um, being associated with particularly high level uh, psychological functions um, like imagination um, and uh, this uh, system being especially expanded in in our species and um, yeah anyway um, we were seeing drops in blood flow in this particular network that's normally um, heavily perfused and so uh, I guess yeah reading Carl's work also being drawn a little bit into complexity science um, which is, I suppose, the study of complex systems, really. Um, uh, I started to think more and more about, yeah, I guess, you know, these counteracting forces of, of order and chaos and how the psychedelic state was qualitatively chaotic in some sense um, and what that might mean and then seeing these drops in blood flow in regions that are normally, um, you know, uh, um, heavily perfused and and I suppose there's, there's, I keep repeating that but there's something important about that if you have a, a system that has um, what they call um, uh, uh, well gradients or, or differences in homogeneities in it um, it's telling you that there's a degree of, of, of some kind of order in that system because if it was just um, entirely homogenous and the same everywhere like if blood flow was the same everywhere then you would have a system with no real no real um uh nothing to it really it's just it's just the same it's it's homogenous throughout and no information uh um in some sense you know you could consider that system highly entropic because there's no there's no differences there. There's no bits of information. It's just pure um, uh, scrambledness in a way. Or you could consider it entirely, you know, um, sort of static and 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 frozen uh, in in blood flow being uniform everywhere. But but um, I guess thinking of entropy actually initially perhaps wrongly or, or in a slightly misleading way, I was thinking of it in a thermodynamic sense. I was also influenced by a schooling in Freudian psychology, um, which um, uh, was influenced by the likes of, um, of Helmholtz, who, um, 
who would uh, characterize systems in a in a thermodynamic way and um, and uh, and so I was thinking of of, of entropy uh, at least initially in a thermodynamic way and I was thinking of how a uh, a system that has gradients in in terms of heat distribution for example if if there were there were certain um, aspects of the system that were disproportionately hot for example like disproportionately perfused have more blood flow than elsewhere and then that spreads then that would be characteristic of a system increasing in entropy um, so the the kind of dispersing um, uh, principle of, of of the second law of th thermodynamics that 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 you know, things tend towards this spread and this this randomness from 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 something which is you know opposite to that, which is ordered. Um, and so, I was thinking of of what we were seeing in in the human brain with regions that are normally heavily perfused becoming less so in this entropic thermodynamic entropic way of a, of the spread of of um, of the blood flow, like a spread of heat, like something consistent with a with an entropic kind of dispersal. So I basically told a, a friend of mine at, at Imperial about this, who's a cognitive neuroscientist, a guy called Robert Leach. And uh, he said, ah, oh, you know, I was, I was using the term entropy, and he says, ah, oh, oh, the, the entropic brain. <laughs> and so I need to credit that term to, to this guy, Robert Leach. He's now a professor at uh, King's College London, um, who, who initially gave me the name. and. Uh, I do credit him in the in the original paper, um, uh, in the acknowledgement section that he came up with the name, but but it just it spoke to me. And then, in time, um, through a better reading, really of of the measure measures of, of entropy, um, I my thinking slightly shifted away from this thermodynamic take to something which was more grounded in information theory. Um, which is, um, in in some people's view, and probably correctly, uh, a, a purer um, purer index of of, of um, a purer representation of what entropy is. Uh, and so, if I spell that out and unpack it a little bit in information theory, um, and pioneered by Claude Shannon in the late 1940s, I think. Um, uh, there, it, you know, he's got a famous book called, um, I think it's Theory on Communication. Um, but it, he was very much the father of <laughs> theory. Bless you. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, no, and and, um, and there, the principle is that that entropy is a measure, a dimensional, a dimensionless measure. It doesn't have a particular um, unit of measurement, which is important, and it's important because it may be telling us that there's something fundamental and in some sense transcendent, as in transcending different domains of measurement, um, something fundamental and, and, and basic uh, and transcendent about what entropy is, that it can work as a dimensionless uh, measure. Uh, and, and so what, what, what is it? Let's keep, keep things, try and keep things simple here. Um, it's an uh, index of... Um, of the really it's an index of our uncertainty about a system if that system is a coin then the coin has typically two sides with different things on heads or tails let's say you flip it up and it could land on one of two so you've got a bit of information there you've got one bit of information it could either be heads or tails then you've got a a, 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 a dice for, for example a die uh, you roll it, you know, it's got six sides. It could land on one of six. You've got uh, uh, five different possibilities there or six, but five bits of information, I think, is how it works. Um, and so, you know, and, and these are very simple systems, but take that into, you know, something like the human brain and it's almost infinite in its, in its bits of potential information. Uh, all the dynamics and, 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 and all the different components and, and levels at which we might measure um, aspects of those dynamics and, and you can apply the metric in this way. And, and so, so an example of where it's been applied um, uh, over recent years and particularly in recent years um, 
is something called lempel ziv uh, um, complexity, um, which is a, a which is is very you know intimately related to a, a measure of entropy. It's basically the it's looking at um, typically it's something that you would apply to EEG or MEG um, measurements of ongoing brain activity, which are brain waves in in sort of lay speak activity oscillating um, uh, 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 over time, and um, and that activity can either be predictable. Let's say during um, an anesthetized state, you would look at brain activity, and it would be you know, kind of high amplitude, slow, a lot of slow activity, everything kind of more or less moving up and down in, in concert, um, but no real information there, you know, because just big chunks of, of brain are just oscillating together and, you know, no real complexity. Um, uh, the brain is operating in, a, in quite a simple mode. You look at consciousness and it's in an anesthetized state, contentless, there isn't consciousness as we um, typically understand it, um, and and um, and you have a very low, well, quite a low entropy um, state, low complexity. Lempel ziff value would be low. Let's take that up to say dream sleep, and now you've got some content, some some you know quality to to conscious experience. And brain activity, lo and behold, becomes more complex. You know, the, it's less regular, less predictable. Um, and you apply your, your lempel ziff, uh, your LZ measure, and you've got a higher measure, you know. And you can show this very reliably, you know, your deep sleep, for example, or anesthetized state down here. You bump up into REM sleep, you've got more quality of consciousness, a richer quality of consciousness, and LZs up here. Wake is more or less on par with REM sleep, normal waking consciousness. And, you know, the richness of conscious experience is more or less, you know, on par, in, I would argue, and there's probably ways of measuring it in, in dreaming as, as during wake. Now, the interesting thing is what do psychedelics do? Well, they seem to elevate it above, above wake. Um, so normal waking consciousness used to be considered maximal, really, for complexity, um, uh, I think short of seizure, I think there's some evidence that, that, that seizure, you, you bump things up. But then we know when people seizure in the transition phase, if it's a temporal lobe epilepsy, for example, it's often actually content rich and, and a bit psychedelic. So, mm. you know, maybe there's something interesting there. And maybe certain psychedelics like 5-methoxy-DMT, there's a little bit of, of evidence might promote um, um, seizure in some people. Um, uh, at least at high doses. So again, you know, maybe there's some something in that uh, in relation to seizure. But 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 otherwise, normal waking consciousness was considered maximal for complexity or entropy. Think of those things as more or less synonymous. If complexity is just randomness, scrambledness, entropy is the same thing really. Um, and uh, normal waking consciousness, psychedelic state. That's something that we we reported on in 2017, I think, in a scientific reports paper um and so so now you know there's a the the whole entropic brain idea has has matured somewhat um uh rather than it being kind of very theoretical and tied in with freudian metapsychology um it started to um be a bit firmer in what it's saying um and 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 kind of you know sticking its neck out to say here's a hypothesis let's go with a particular um, flavor, if you want, or just index of entropy, uh, lempel uh, ziff, and um, and we can make predictions and say, for example, the psychedelic state is more entropic than normal waking consciousness. You can see that in the brain with with lempel ziff, your LZ measure, and now part of the um, agenda for me and for our team. And I think for others as well, doing psychedelic research, um, there aren't that many really, um, is to let's, you know, we're making some headway with the brain, but let's, let's, you know, if the name of the game is to make mappings between mind stuff and brain stuff, um, I imagine we'll go here probably as the mm. interview goes on in terms of philosophy and such like, um, uh, then let's improve our indices of 
of mind stuff. Um, let's not neglect that because mm. it's as important as the other side. It's easy to be seduced by, oh, wow, this, you know, sophisticated, complex brain science. But, you know, uh, um, that's just one, one part of one part of the puzzle. And actually, you know, in terms of signal and noise, we might be picking up more noise in the mind stuff through not measuring it very well. So for example, if we we're making mappings between a rating of the intensity of the subjective experience with the psychedelic and something going on in the brain, then that's a very crude, incredibly crude effort at indexing the psychology of the psychedelic experience to mm. apply a simple rating of its intensity. It's really not telling us anything. So, you know, how can we improve our our ratings? How can we draw data from free reports? How can we use interview techniques to try and perhaps um, uh, revisit an experience post hoc, conjure it up again, you know, um, coax some aspect of that uh, um, experience back up into consciousness so it can be reported. Um, and so the, this is where we're going now. And, and, and so uh, what I'm talking to a few students about and already, you know, they're taking the initiative on things as well in, in their own rights um, is to try and tackle this, this topic of the entropic mind, if you want. I do think, you know, there is a reasonable distinction to make between mind and brain um, uh, that's pragmatic, really, and just reflects, you know, <laughs> the way things are. Um, than to bang on, you know, some, you know, eliminativist uh, um, message that you only need to to get the brain. You know, that, that I, I just see that as neglectful and, and ignorant, really. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so we're trying to, you know, improve and, and, and get, you could look at things like language, you know, how complex and how unpredictable is the language that someone is using either well, during a psychedelic state, it's difficult because people can't really talk. <laughs> um, but in a in a report of their experience, post hoc report, you could look at maybe the richness of the language and the way uh, they would jump from word to word, um, that kind of thing. Um, you could try and collect some reports with lower doses. I mean, this is a classic, classic dilemma. Um, a kind of um, uncertainty principle kind of dilemma for a, a psychedelic neuroscientist, if you want, which is the problem of, of sampling the experience, you know, and the, the sampling it has to be done really post hoc and it can't be done, um, uh, it, it can't be really done in real time because either the drug effects are so strong that nothing can be reported. Um, uh, or when you come to take a report, um, you interfere with, with the experience and so contaminate the phenomenon of interest. So, you know, it, it's a, it's a, it's a problem and there are solutions, none of them perfect, but it's one of those situations where you have to be pragmatic and try and find, you know, the best, maybe a series of best, um, you know, least bad options mm -hmm. uh, and and also the the approach of tackling it from a number of different angles so anyway yeah yeah so as you're talking about that last part there i was wondering about um giving someone you know free opportunity to the next day write out their experience and instead of being like oh we're trying to utilize their uh, their descriptions to get accurate information about what happened to them so much as you know researching the way people narrativize the experiences that they have when given free permission to just sit down unintruded write us the story of what happened and then be able to collect those things analyze and isolate specific themes or archetypes and then maybe hold them in distinction to the larger sort of reservoir of, uh, of, of uh, rep trip reports that are, you know, widely available on the internet, searching for specific themes and qualities. And then when you kind of get the metrics on what themes are most present, then you can utilize that for constructing some type of survey to, and then be able to, you know, like, 
pay attention to or, or around what time generally did they report that they interacted with an entity around what time you know did they interact with an entity or no entity you know what level of content was consciously um was was consciously uh, sort of self-referencing their own history. What what degree of the content on what dose went to a seemingly transpersonal state, and then aligning that somewhat generally with what the profile of the brain was of that person, and then in reference to this larger reservoir, and to see if you can come up with some sort of uh, you know some sort of model for what the psilocybin space specifically looks like generally. Um, when you're in there. I mean, mm. that's just something that came up as you're speaking. It seems interesting. Yeah. Well, no, that's an approach that we're more or less uh, adopting at the moment, which is, um, yeah, that we have some students and collaborators working on Erawid trip reports, for yeah. example, um, and, and trying to um, identify um, certain themes that are, that are um, referred to... Um, and um, and apply certain natural language algorithms to um, to the language that's being used and the interactions between components of of the words that are being used. Uh, and th- these kind of natural language analytics are proving, you know, remarkably um, uh, effective at, at at doing things like predicting future. Um, states like future mental health states for example right. i just read something on reddit uh yesterday about being able to analyze language to determine a person's um level of depression or possible like predictors of entering into a depressive state yeah yeah so it's it, it, it's being used in that way it's being used to predict conversion to psychosis and people showing at risk factors for potential conversion to to a psychotic disorder like schizophrenia for example um, uh, there's a, a, a really interesting TED talk on this by a friend of mine um, called Mariano Sigman that I um, would recommend people check out. Um, and then, you know, so there's the language that people use, but if we're, you know, communicating a lot via um, uh, digital media, we, we also have behaviors there that, that might be predictive, like, um, you know, um, the things that we're saying in our text messages or uh, how much we're writing, how much we're communicating. Um, yeah, so although it starts to become potentially quite intrusive, there are companies now actually that are, are um, trying to develop these technologies to show that there are more sophisticated ways of of, of, of predicting um, people's behavior and how that might be prognostic uh, about, you know, where they're going to be in terms of their mental health uh, and maybe, you know, almost signal an alarm that something's happening that you might not be conscious of yet, but mm-hmm. is saying, you, you know, you might be spiraling towards a depression or or into a manic episode, for example. See, that's a weird, that's a bit of a weird double-edged sword um, because that type of power given to an organization can be thoroughly misused. I mean, I wouldn't want Facebook having that power. They already have it, you know. If you've ever had that experience of... Um, of talk, like talking about something to someone and then randomly seeing it on your Facebook feed as an ad. And I think it's really easy to go, oh, they're just listening to me all the time. But I think what's more disturbing is that the, the metadata that they have on us is so succinct that they don't need to listen to us. It's that good at predicting our behavior, which I think yeah. is a lot scarier than it's listening to us. Um, and, and this whole idea of, of analyzing the language of a psychedelic experience is complex too, because at what point do you say, you know, watch for certain idiosyncratic terms that might be in reference to their history that they would not be able to notice after having taken a complex or like, you know, a, a, a thorough history of that person psychologically? Um, and then, you know, how do you rate how familiar they are with other people's reported experiences? And then it's like, so is some language actually not exactly accurate to what they experience, but is an approximation based on what they've already read? And then if that's the case, is it manipulating the data? Because, yeah. it's, you know, so it would get to be like, I mean, oh, and interesting big, and uncertain, you know? Absolutely. And, and that's a big problem as well. You know, if you're if you're dealing with something like, as we are, um, 
DMT and, and entity encounters and how it can be, how you can be influenced by what is been already said and written about these experiences and then how that can um, come to prime you potentially to, to have them or and, and same with the so-called mystical type experiences, the kind of priming that can go on so that if someone has something akin to those experiences, they'll use the language and the framework uh, that, that, they've, that they've heard of in the past to say, Yes, that, that's what I had. It was a mystical experience. And, mm-hmm. so and even uh, even the language or the framework of, you know, like a modern Western English compared to how someone might describe it from a different uh, cultural yeah, background as well, absolutely. which are things to consider. Absolutely. I mean, an impressive uh, young philosopher, scientist who's been um, influencing our group a, a bit on this topic is a chap called Raphael Millier. Um, he's got a really nice paper on drug-induced ego dissolution, um, uh, which has the helpful acronym of DIED. <laughs> and, <laughs> Very nice. Yeah, so he's be, been doing things like looking at Erowid trip reports and, and driving data um, uh, from from that, but um, he, he's also uh, um, had some mentorship from uh, um, scientists in um, France that had developed something called um, what's it called? New, um, uh, gosh, it's a certain microphenomenology. That's it, and it's a way of drilling down into the into phenomenology to try and um, go beyond framework specific terminology. So, if for mm. example, I mean the classic one is. Is, is a phrase like ego dissolution, you know, which can annoy some people. They're like, you know, why, why are you bringing Freud into this? Or, um, or you know, oh, ego is such a Western concept or whatever. And um, what, what's meant by ego? You use that term and, and, you know, and there's so many assumptions tied up in it. You know, what do you really mean? And it's a great principled, you know, it's a great principle and principled approach to say, look, we're going to go beyond that, you know, so if someone says, oh, you know, and then I, then I transitioned into this state, which was complete ego dissolution, the interviewer would say, you know, what, what do you mean by that, more or less, and, um, and try and really get to some descriptors that are, um, that, that are framework free as much as, as much as that's possible, because on some level, you could also argue, it's impossible. Because you're always having to use words, you know, that that have baggage. <laughs> and- What's interesting is I, I'm thinking about, and I don't know if it's a faux pas in the psychedelic science for you guys to mention Terence McKenna or something, but uh, but one of his premises was this idea that you went into something that was beyond language, and that when you came back, you you approximated the language as best you could. So it's interesting to. You know, okay, now we've got these common terms, the consequence of the of the subculture talking about it so much over the years and, you know, thousands of people being just completely, you know, struck at awe by their experiences and sort of grappling to make sense of them. We have this these threads of language that are, that are emerging inside of, you know, to describe a psychedelic experience. But then to ask like, yeah, but what does that mean? What does that mean? What does that yeah. mean? It's really this interesting sort of um, excavation of the mind to harvest language that wouldn't have been there otherwise. Um, yeah. So that, that that's pretty curious. That's pretty curious. I, think, so. I mean, you know, um, uh, Terence McKenna said a lot of, you know, very smart and incisive things. He also said some kind of, he kind of pushed it. I think that's the issue. <laughs> right, right. But he wasn't a scientist, right? He was a, he was a poet uh, after a poet. all. And, and, yeah. and, uh, and he, he, you know, and he, he was incredible. Um, and, you know, maybe I should do more service to him actually by actually reading some of his material. I, I only sort of hear bits, you know, because he was such a great orator. There are you know, things that you can find online and such like. But but that that principle of, of you know, you have an experience that's that, that's um, beyond language um, makes a lot of sense on a number of levels. You can bring in things like, uh, and not everyone likes this, but I think they misunderstand it when they don't like it. But the idea of of, a, of the experience, the psychedelic experience, particularly at higher doses, but but also more generally being regressive, mm-hmm. you know, regressive in terms of of age, um, but also maybe even evolutionary development. You know, back to a, a more um, 
uh, an earlier state um, uh, where perhaps there is less of a separation between self and other and self and and everything that's not self. Um, well, let's let's go there actually because that that was a part of the entropic brain model, the suggestion of primary states and secondary states, and you have this you know spectrum from very ordered to very chaos or entropic and that waking consciousness sits somewhere in this place that we have enough order to basically adaptively function in the world know who we are compared to who other people are and and um and be able to you know self-reflect in, in an effective way too much order and we self-reflect into what you, you know what you reference depressive realism um, rumination you know, we get depression in general, you know, too much chaos, and we get, you know, early psychosis, maybe full blown schizophrenia, also into that, you know, little bit more chaos or more entropy is your suggestion of, uh, you know, this is where psychedelic states are, possibly this is where children are. And you reference that, you know, the secondary state is waking consciousness, and that development of the, you know, using the term, pardon me, like the ego self in a, in a healthy way, um, and that the primary states are in more chaos. Do you want to talk a little bit about primary states and secondary states in specific reference to this concept of regression, which would then to suggest that the secondary state is a progression from these primary states, um, and talking maybe in comparison of the psychedelic state to the, to the mind of a child, or the subjective yes. experience of a child, even. <clears throat> Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, in, in hindsight, I think the, the an analogy or the comparison with, with children is, is, is better and more meaningful than, than certain, you know, than bringing in psychopathologies because, um, they're so mixed, you know, because in a, in a psychotic episode, you might have a more entropic system, both in terms of mind and brain. Um, uh, but then, um, in a chronic, schizophrenia where a delusion has formed maybe all of a sudden everything is clear and i know you know it's a it's a conspiracy and mm. and the feds are, are controlling everything those or, are I don't, my parents yeah <laughs> yeah yeah. Yeah. yeah um and then order comes so it's it's, it's a complex it, it's a much more complex space uh psychopathology um uh, there's talking of children there's my son in the background um yeah um but uh um uh yeah um the 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 thing with i mean the secondary secondary states secondary consciousness um being um um uh bit normal waking consciousness being of of secondary consciousness uh is something that makes a lot of sense to me that that's where we go as adults in this modern world, and that's where we go as modern-day human beings. Um, but also that. Um, sorry, there's an alarm going off as well. That's annoying. I picked the, I, what I thought was the quietest room in the house. But... No, you did. You did a good job. It's all right. Okay. <laughs> um, and um, uh, that the the point really is and and criticality comes in here and you were alluding to that in terms of you know a, a a kind of sweet spot um uh which is what criticality is criticality is a phenomenon really that comes with lots of different signatures of criticality but why is it called criticality it's it's this notion that there is a critical point at which you see certain self-organization in complex systems um like in living systems in nature you know the forest yeah um yeah and 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 virtually everything in mm -hmm. in nature um exhibiting this this self-organization yeah like an ecosystem um uh, like the living earth <laughs> right right or at least like the living earth has been uh, has been yeah, right because it's definitely entering a state of entropy um, isn't it be it isn't human caused or whatever it's definitely yeah. entering isn't a it? state of chaos and isn't that curious and 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 what's contributed to that is humans um uh trying to control uh the chaos of nature uh rather than just letting it be <laughs> oh so that's so interesting you know because like you talk about how you know when we get too heavily into a 
you know, a secondary state, which I couldn't help reading almost as though the secondary state was on a bit of a pedestal, um, although I could be misinterpreting your writing there. And then I thought, well, I mean, is it really that good? Because it seems like it's not evolution towards ah the apex of the secondary state because too much of it is damaging. And it's pretty clear that we have too much secondary state consciousness in the world now. And the consequence of it is the, you know, the, 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 the larger global civilizational, you know, consumerism and, and, the, and the impact that's having on our ecology, which is greater chaos in our natural world, which is only going to contribute to greater chaos in our own lives as a consequence of trying to be maybe too structured or too heavily in the secondary state. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's it. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's, a, it's a phenomenon, really, that it, it would be easy to politicize, you know, mm-hmm. and I've uh, I kind of um, flirted with that possibility a little bit and, and sort of uh, kind of held, held back as well. But, uh, you know, it's difficult uh, to entirely. But um, uh, I mean, it's a, 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 this fascinating question of, of, of a value judgment, really, you know, is secondary consciousness, ego consciousness, let's say, uh, maybe that's more intuitive, let's call it ego consciousness. Um, uh, is it a good thing? Mm. <laughs> you know, in some sense, it, it's kind of, it, to an extent, it's civilization, really. Um, but then it's also the corruption of civilization as uh, as we've sought to control n- ourselves, which, of course, you know, are things of nature um, to such an extent and other people and society, systems of people and nature more more broadly just that that drive that industry towards control Mm. uh, uh, and uh, and now how it's um how it's kind of you know backfiring on us and and is um posing to backfire on uh, on us and the rest of, of you know more or less the rest of the living um system and humanity uh, as we know it into the future yeah in a in a in a you know um dramatic and yeah cataclysmic yeah, i'm finding i'm finding uh, i got like about 30 seconds ago i got extremely excited about something and i was like oh, let him finish speaking um but talking about ego consciousness and primary states and you know too much ego consciousness contributing to depression um and depression being a widespread illness depression and sort of related other things you know you know anxiety obsessive compulsive disorder whatever um being sort of like the great epidemics of the modern world um and that and that you know that being maybe aligned with the sort of like modus operandi of human civilization civilization currently which is an ongoing detachment from the natural world and an increasing investment into um into controlling the natural world and in a way that's unnatural to it um and that psilocybin research is showing people to come out of depression in you know well-structured environments and one of the suggestions that you make is that the psilocybin you know brings people into this place of criticality which allows them to change these whatever patterns they were entrenched in that was causing the depression and bring them back into a healthier ego consciousness and one of the consequences of or a couple of the consequences of that is that people tend to have less authoritarian behaviors and are less aligned with authoritarianism, as well as a greater um, appreciation of nature, beauty, and a greater ecological mindfulness, uh, which are all consequences of, of the psilocybin experience. So there's like this interesting, I mean, it's sort of like a played out term, but this interesting reflection of the microcosm and the macrocosm insofar as our civilization situation right now with its epidemics and its impact on the ecology and what a and what psilocybin is offering the individual person uh, insofar as the resolution of these sort of like hyperactive ego states. Yeah, I mean, the, the in- interesting thing is that you, you know, um, like these, if, well, it seems this way, if you take a high enough dose of a psychedelic the movement towards a more entropic system is 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 like an irresist, irresistible force you know no matter how hard you try to resist it you're going to trip you're going to trip hard you know it might be 
uh, horrible, but uh, it's going to be intense. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but a similar kind of irresistibility or inevitability uh, um, to things is um, is that you come back to ego consciousness, and and um, so there is that fascinating paradox there that you can't ever really get rid of it, you know. But what you come back to ego consciousness with is is I guess a broader um, uh, awareness um, um, and I guess the, you know I get, it's really fascinating questions that aren't easy to answer so you can just uh, I could well personally speaking I can only play with them at the moment but I guess the, 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 the notion is that there's something something's gone awry I think we could probably agree <laughs> on <that. laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and um, and so so what is it you know that the uh, and i it's a it's a delicate balance and that's where it, you know uh, the 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 phenomenon of criticality and the science of of criticality self organized systems complex systems is kind of where you need to go i think at least scientifically to 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 get a bit of a handle on this um and it it's so the, the principle that i would perhaps want to put forward is that we've overshot you know uh Ego consciousness was was a good thing. <laughs> we we kind of overdid it. Maybe we got too much cortex, or or we uh, you know, or just look at the environment. You know, we overdid it in terms of our industriousness. You know, there's something to be said for a nice garden, <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. in the sense that it could be wild, but it would look a bit disheveled and and a bit ugly, really. You know, um, cut the grass put in some flowers, you know, leave a, a degree of, of nature expressing itself. Don't pavement over it all, you know, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. find a, a nice harmony there where it, it, it feels good. It works. And, and there's, you know, a lot of symbiosis going on and, 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 but, um, yeah, that, this, this is the thing, you know, we, we seem to have overshot and now how do we get back? I mean, we might be forced back, um, Right, but how, right. how do we get back to something which is is more symbiotic? Um, you know, when I, I sometimes things pop up on my Facebook feed with these amazing new technologies that can, I don't know, clear up uh, oil from from the sea or, uh, or do amazing things with plastic or whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, and it gives gives me hope. But I, I just wish, you know, it's it's not a futile hope and and because the probably the more likely alternative is that we're gonna this this self-correction is going to be forced upon us because uh of uh, the chaos that will ensue yeah. when uh when things get too hot and and weather gets you know too wild and chaotic and there's mass migration on a scale that we haven't seen before mm, food uh, shortages the, and yeah yeah, yeah it's gonna be interesting isn't it and probably yeah, who, who knows when when that that storm is coming? Mm-hmm. Uh, let's but, let's uh, let's let's jump back a second. I mean, unless you have something you really need to get out there, not yeah. really. No, let's jump back because um, you know, and much appreciated. We got pretty out there for a second, which is awesome. Um, and I feel that there wasn't an <clears throat> accurate description um, provided about why you see, um, you know, the the consciousness of a child uh to be somewhat akin to the consciousness of somebody on say lsd yeah so um it's 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 quite a concrete thing really in the in the sense that um you see it in both mind and brain so let's take the brain because it's a nice way of getting a handle on how the brain works um is is through the question of how does the brain develop and so if you take a uh, a newborn um and uh, and you watch their brain change as they mature, you'll see a few things. You'll see that the brain um, starts to self-organize, uh, starts to increase in its organization, but it does it in a particular way. Um, so the brain and the mind and behavior begins to specialize, uh, and you start to see that in the brain. So you start to see specialized systems uh, that do specific things. Um, uh, and um, they, um, the components that make up those systems become more tightly interrelated. So within the system, there's more of a tight uh, cohesion, um, 
like uh, let's say you know uh, um, oh gosh uh, um, uh, a particular you know organization within an, within an army for example getting tight you know brotherhood and they're, they're working together in a uh, and that particular unit is very cohesive um, but it, but as the the mind and the brain develops and behavior develops something else happens as well um, uh, so you get a, a more tight cohesion within a system but you also start to see systems parcelating off from each other becoming um, more distinct from each other they'll talk to each other but they'll do it in a in a, in a quite um, uh, uh, sort of sparse, uh, reduced uh, uh, way. So sort um, of like in early life, we don't really have a lot of neocortex going on. We have a lot more limbic system activation than as neocortex starts to work much better, it sort of disconnects its capacity to communicate with the limbic areas of the brain, like the subcortical regions. I, and, and I that I understand that I, I, yeah. no idea on your level here, but it's, it's more it's it's more of thinking about cortex itself. It's more about organization of cortex, really, because there's some evidence that actually there's there's in a certain way there's more certain connections between limbic and cortex actually develop as we develop, particularly mm -hmm. in around sort of adolescence. Um, uh, it's more perhaps that that the emotional brain, if you want, is is starting to. Uh, interconnect or trying to at least better with the analytical brain and mind um, uh, um, at, cer at certain critical periods. But but if we think of cortical organization um, more more specifically, within the cortex, for example, you have the visual visual system, which is mostly concentrated at the back of the brain, but also has other bits that that, that are elsewhere. But mostly, it's in the back of the brain. Motor system, mostly at the top of the brain, again, some other bits, but mostly at the top, auditory system, kind of like underneath our ears and lateralized like that. But these systems, they become more, more segregated, really, as they specialize. It's just something that seems, seems to happen. You could think of analogies in terms of like geopolitics and how nations develop and, and um, maybe at a certain period become sort of maximally segregated in some sense mm. it may be that that changes and and the 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 you know i should try and stay on track but but maybe some future state is is where the, there's better communication and less of segregation between nation states um but if we think of a of an adult human's brain as being very much about a lot of different nation states within the head doing specialized things in a specialized way you know, you reach a certain age and you've got you've got movement, motor action, you know, quite, quite well down. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but you look at that in an infant and it's all over the place, you know, and that's kind of that's the way you'd characterize the brain. If, so if we rewind the story and regress rather than develop or progress um, uh, and, and we look at an infant's brain, we see a brain that is less segregated Um and if you, so if we look at the brain as a whole, you see something that in a way is working more globally, um, more in a more globally integrated way. Um, uh, and so rather than these systems being segregated off from each other, there's, there's much more bleed between the different systems. And that could explain a lot of things that are characteristic of, of the psychedelic state and, and maybe are there in infancy. Um, uh, you know, blending of sensory modalities, for example. Um, and uh, the other thing is that uh, the systems themselves, so let's take the visual system. If you look at its integrity uh, in an adult, you know, it's very, very um, uh, highly integrated. Rewind the story down to, to an infant. There, there's disintegration within that system. It, it breaks down within itself. But in doing so, there's more talk with other systems. That's something that you see in an infant's brain. And that's something that you see in a, in a psychedelic brain as well. And then you could just, you know, wax lyrical about the phenomenological overlaps mm -hmm. of an infant's brain and a, and, a, and a psychedelic person's brain. Right, uh, right. And, and, and although we, we would be getting into maybe some level of neurorealism, which I'd like to talk to you about later, there is yeah. some consideration there as to why, you know, and, and we were talking about this issue with sort of like the 
overactivated ego consciousness of modern civilization. Uh, and, um, you know, one thing that we didn't mention, which I think is important, but we don't have to go into is trauma. And the impact trauma has on, on this overactive, sort of like the profile of an overactive ego consciousness. Um, and then thinking that, you know, regressing into a, a childhood type state might be a capacity to, uh, you know, re-establish the early psychological development um, that contributed to, say, psychopathology later in life by regressing them to a place. And I know imprinting is not a very popular term these days, but sort of like re-imprinting or reconditioning that person's like deep subconscious mind through these types of experiences, which then have a uh, you know the 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 epiphenomenon of a change in their adult consciousness in their in, in their sort of like normal ego state. Yeah, I'm sorry, there was a phone that was ringing there, but I was following you. But I, um, so trauma and ego consciousness and um, regressing. Um, back to a, a state of high plasticity, for example, uh, during like an age regression in a uh, in say PTSD. Um, uh, you know, people might bring in things like the notion of split personalities or dissociative identity disorder. Um, this this which is split personality, bit of a like bit of a nonsense, really. It, it, it's a kind of lay phenomenon that or term that. The closest thing in 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 um, in uh, um, I guess psychiatric phenomenology would be dissociative identity disorder. You know, and, and it's very much what you were describing. I think of of the potential. You know, having suffered a trauma, and let's say you you take someone who's now in adulthood, and maybe the trauma was suffered in childhood. They might enter a, a, a dissociate, dissociated um, state in which they regress to a childhood state and start talking in a child's voice. And, um, and yeah, what's happening there? Well, you know, maybe maybe there's something that's almost functional. I, I tend to take quite a functionalist view on psychopathology and sort of I, I do try and understand. And it, this is just something that happens intuitively, really. You know why? Why do you get depressed? You know why do you mm. go mad, so to speak? Um, why do you have manic episodes and such like? And I suppose you know why would you have d a dissociative identity disorder where, having suffered, let's say, a sexual abuse in childhood, you would go back to a childhood state? You know why? Why would that kind of that 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 be forced upon you in a way? Uh, and maybe. There's some there's some interesting I, I mean, for myself, I'm pretty deep into research around trauma uh, or a trauma informed psychotherapy psychotherapy. Um, and there's a there's a pretty strong, you know, leaning in a lot of that work right now to suggest that most psychopathologies now are a consequence of, of trauma and a, and a distorted modeling system. Um, that sort of traps certain aspects of the self developmentally um, that are then expressed in ways that that are dysfunctional because they don't allow us to be present with the actuality of our experience, but instead continue to hold on to, you know, the, the, you know, the, the trauma of the past, the uncompleted emotional pain of the past. Um, but that might be like, kind of like maybe too big to get into. Um, no, and, no, it's a good one. But you, it's, it's a good one because it's, uh, it's, it sort of ties in with, uh, with, with some, stuff that I've been thinking about and, and writing about recently. And so I've got a paper that's under review, which is co-authored with uh, Carl Friston. Uh, it's, uh, who, who knows how it gets uh, reviewed by the reviewers, but it's, it's with a couple at the moment. But, uh, but the title is, um, is um, relaxed, um, relaxed, beliefs under um under psychedelics and i use this acronym of rebus uh, r-e-b-u-s um but uh I, there's another component which isn't isn't written into this article quite so much but i mention it in another one which is is published actually paper in um current opinion in psychiatry and i call that one um tightened um beliefs uh um 
tighten beliefs with uncertainty, I think it is, or in response to uncertainty, tightened beliefs in response to uncertainty. Anyway, um, it, it very much ties in with this uh, Fristonian view on, on the way the mind and the brain and behavior and life to some extent um, works, which is that systems tend to resist the second law of th thermodynamics and self-organize. Why do they do that? Well, we can understand that in terms of the brain and the mind more easily. And, and there the principle is that systems, living systems, tend to um, – resist uh, uncertainty. Um, uh, uncertainty is a synonym, not uh, coincidentally, uh, for entropy. Um, and um, and the, 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 um, so, so this, this model that I, I present in this Rebus paper, Relaxed Beliefs and uh, um, Psychedelics, is that that's kind of what psychedelics do. It's that they um, they relax the models, beliefs, models, synonyms, really, um, uh, that are instantiated within our minds and our bodies and, and our brains, and we might be able to say how in our brains. Um, and those, those um, beliefs uh, rest on a certain kind of organization, a hierarchical organization in uh, the brain, uh, and that hierarchy needs to collapse. It needs to at least relax uh, in order for there to, in order for there to be change, some kind of change to those to those beliefs. Um, and if you take a psychopathology like depression, for example. Um, you, you know, unless it's for some perverse reason, you would argue that you want the depression and the depression's good, um, which it might be in some sense, but that's another issue. Um, then you're taking the psychedelic and having the psychedelic therapy, for example, to relax, uh, beliefs that are pathological, that like are, I am worthless. I'm no good. Life sucks. Everything's against me. These kinds of beliefs absolutely yeah on the money on the yeah. money yeah and so you know you you want to relax those beliefs in order to recalibrate them reset them um in a in a healthier way that is more um harmonious with data i mean that's a very mechanistic way of saying it but another way of saying it would be information coming in to the system coming into the hierarchy from within oneself, emotion, memory, bodily feelings, um, outside of oneself in terms of interactions with other beings, um, other people, um, and the world more generally, you know, things like a sense of purpose, a sense of meaning, what's it like when I go to work, you know, if there's more harmony with what you're doing uh, as an entity, then... Um, there's going to be, yeah, well, more harmonious setup. So, yeah, the principle is that you you relax a system that has become, um, th that's gone awry in some way, perhaps is too top heavy, which might be how you characterize, you know, a very ruminative, analytical mind, uh, um, all cortex, or you know, um, uh, um, trying in vain to to find some sense, make some sense, even if it means in order to find that certainty of some sort, you have to shut yourself away in a dark room and, um, and think you're worthless and life is pointless. And at least it brings a degree of stability, you know, or you take a flight from reality and, and now it's all because of, uh, you know, the aliens or, or the feds or something. Right. And, and everything tightens up, right? Tightened, uh, beliefs in response to uncertainty. The basic principle here is that there's something um, fundamentally um, uh, aversive um, about uncertainty, about entropy, about chaos. Hmm. If that wasn't the case, human beings wouldn't have been so industrious in their uh, histories to try uh, at least, you know, Western man uh, to try and take control 
over nature um, so that things are less uncertain. Mm. Um, and it, it's just that we massively overshot and it's making us us ill and it's making the earth ill. Right, uh, right. So and we the, need, yeah. go ahead. Well, and, and just there's an argument there for some kind of uh, recalibration. Right, uh, right. So, you know, a lot of what you're saying here is, is, uh, is pretty interesting because, you know, the, the, especially this idea of being top heavy, this trauma informed somatic based psychotherapy, basically it suggests that the trauma is a, is an emotional wound that's stuck in the body because an adaptive mechanism was employed at the time of the of the traumatic event to protect oneself but that because safety was not you know provided to discharge and complete that um you know that emotional trauma it sort of stays stuck and over time that adaptive protection mechanism becomes a maladaptive identity structure which then eventually contributes to something like depression um, because it disconnects us from being able to be present with actually what's happening in our in our moment to moment because we're being ongoingly and subconsciously influenced by stuck emotions from the past and that when we get out of the stories that our mind tells us that validate and reinforce the inner emotional experience and just in a safe relational context such as in a relationship with a psychotherapist or mm -hmm in relationship with a mystical type experience on psychedelics that when we when we you know relax that part of the mind and we go back into the physical uh, like the direct physical somatic experience of those of those wounds and we're able to emotionally process them inside of a safe container or inside of a safe relationship that the consequences of that the maladaptive identity structures melt away because you're no longer protecting yourself from the past. That past is now completed. And so you're able to be more accurately present with what's happening in our in the moment to moment of life because you're no longer being influenced by stuck emotions and the stories around those emotions from the past. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, it's just, I mean, that's the ideal. Uh, and, and, you know, Without psychedelics, it, it's so hard to achieve that kind of um, development, which is about going back in order to reprocess and go forward. You know, classically, I suppose, the uh, therapeutic model that has tried to do things that way might be psychoanalytic psychotherapy, but it's just so hard to achieve. And, and what you would typically find in in that kind of psychotherapy or, or, or maybe some, you know, I guess a, a potential advance on that would be something that tries to accelerate processes that would be ideal in psychoanalytic psychotherapy, like, um, like reliving or, you know, a cathartic ab, ab reaction kind of, uh, process of going back there, reliving, having some kind of emotional release, and then through being embedded in, in, a, in a psychoanalytic psychotherapy setup, having ample opportunity to talk through and, and, and work through what, what's come up, you know. Mm. But, but as, as, you know, the world has witnessed, it doesn't really happen with any reliability like that. And it's incredibly right. expensive and, and slow. That's part of the expense. What's the, what's the saying that something like the talking cure um, it was called the talking cure and it turned out it didn't really cure anything. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, I, yeah, it's a cure is so, like this kind of, yeah. Very loaded uh, term. <laughs> yeah. And elusive thing. Yeah. But, uh, even with psychedelics, you know, people would love to say, oh, these, these are the only thing that'll cure you, but that's a very dangerous principle. Uh, um, I think you'd really appreciate some of the some of the newer work that's coming out around you know trauma informed somatic based therapies. Peter Levine, Bessel van der Kolk, um, even uh, neurobiologically, the work of Stephen Porges um, and his polyvagal theory, talking about the you know d the development of the vagus nerve and its and its role inside of uh, you know survival and social engagement behaviors. Because it seems like um, there's a lot of 
real powerful progress that's going on there that is something akin to what's happening inside of a psychedelic experience, um, although not as not as sharp, but having similar effectiveness. And um, I want to I want to dive into something before we uh, follow this next incredible line of rapport, because you're talking about tightened beliefs. Yeah. And as you're talking about Titan beliefs, and we've been on this, you know, like microcosm, macrocosm reflection, um, you know, there are other certain certain types of Titan beliefs that are present. You know, for example, biological psychiatry being quite a tightened belief, you know, that if there's a psychopathology, there's a problem with the brain, and the brain is a physical organ and needs a physical solution, and it's a drug. And if we get better at it, we'll be able to better and better target specific drugs to specific subsections of the brain that do a specific result and change the specific abnormality in the physical organ, um, which is a is a tightened belief, I think, and is not one that is reliably effective on mass um, as the results of, of um, antidepressive drugs uh, and things like treatment-resistant depression sort of you know, make clear. And I wrote this, I wrote this very specific question down. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to read it. I'm going to read it. Um, even though it might not fully sync up, I, I wrote it somewhat specifically. So I'm going to read it off the thing. And it has to do with this idea of Titan beliefs. And uh, it references uh, a term I've heard you talk about, uh, neural realism, which is basically, I have this psychological model. I look at the science. The science says, it does this to the brain. I go, look, see, it does this to the brain. That proves my yeah. psychological model, mm. um, which I've heard you say. I mean, if you want to make it a quick moment to, to talk on that, that we could we could do that if you want to talk on your thoughts on neural realism. Yeah, it's just it's, it's it, uh, another way that it's been referred to is, is reverse inference. You know, if because of brain mind is true, I think you articulated it nicely, but that's it. It's it's, it's an abuse of of uh what i would at least my approach to uh neuroscience human neuroscience is which is about a mapping between between mind phenomena uh and behavior and brain phenomena um but neuroism neurorealism is saying that ultimate truth comes from brain mm -hmm. and brain is the authority and i can give uh, authority to my mind explanation or mind phenomena by appealing to the authority of brain and so it's it's an abuse of of neuroscience i would say hmm. so that that goes that goes into this question that i have um which is definitely like appeal to neuroscience the neuroscience is sort of like an appeal to authority in some way which is of course a logical fallacy so this is the question the way i wrote it down and again it might be slightly out of sync to the conversation because i wrote it you know last night um <clears throat> One of the things I find refreshing about your work is that outside of your published papers, you present yourself in humility to the wonder of the unknown and with a deep respect for science's ability to correct over time, correct itself over time. Um, so leaning into this discussion on neural realism, I'm wondering about the claims uh, that there is a confirmation bias operating in psychedelic neuroscience and an effort to validate paradigmatic expectations about the nature of consciousness being an epiphenomenon of brain activity, which is resulting in a misreporting of the evidence from both the scientists themselves and the media at large. An interesting presentation of this issue was presented in Scientific American back in September in an article titled Misreporting and Confirmation Bias in Psychedelic Research, referencing the mental gymnastics being done to ensure this brain creates consciousness bias stays in place even in the face of the observation that decreased brain activity correlates with increased subjective richness. To me, this doesn't seem like an absurd notion, at least, uh, and, and uh, let, me, let me finish before you talk on that because I'd love to hear your thoughts. <laughs> so to me, the idea that there's, that there's you know, a confirmation bias does not seem like an absurd notion, um, that an entrenched set of physicalist values and opinions internally validated to being correct and any other suggestion um, is seen as not so much as an alternative perspective, but as bad science and wrong. And thus the science must be written for the acknowledgement of the mechanistic psychologists and neuroscientists in the community, um, perhaps because that scientist is entrenched in that worldview, or because an alternative would stain one's reputation and perhaps psychedelic science as a whole. Writing to a piece, the brain creates consciousness paradigm of the reviewers, creates a problem in science that is then missed because it aligns with the established belief structures of the neuroscience community. 
All the while, this constant reinforcement of the established paradigmatic bias only further entrenches science within it, creating an insular ideological community being held up as the intellectual frontier of humanity. Of course, we would be liars to say such a scenario has not existed in science previously, be it that an anthropomorphized god created the universe and that the earth is the center of it, or that the shape of the head could be used to read the psychology of the person, or that women are biologically inferior to men. All of these patently false ideas were held strong by you know, past scientific communities, even in the face of early evidence to the contrary. Given the geopolitical state of the world right now, I don't think we can claim to that today's humanity has emotionally or socially evolved too much further than the humanity a few hundred years back, despite our smartphones and hadron colliders. Um, now, I get that we have to have ourselves grounded in something if we are to explore and learn. Limitlessness is disorienting and boundaries set us free. But I do wonder if because of a cognicentric and physicalist brain origin model for consciousness is so commonplace amongst neuroscience, that the distorting effect of its own predictive modeling for reality is invisible to itself, parading as reputable objectivity and limiting its capacity to allow the wonder of science in the face of the unknown to provide us with an actual understanding of consciousness. Now, without taking an ontological stance, unless you want to, um, I would love for you to comment on this. (laughs) Wow. Okay, well, there's a lot there. Um, Oh, gosh, where to start? Let's be constructive as much as possible rather than and and positive and um pragmatic um so what we have and i can only describe my approach to a question like um how do you um begin to account for uh a psychedelic experiences in all their richness uh by appealing to changes in brain function and activity and um, uh, running the risk of repeating myself a little bit um, uh, I don't feel any um, need or desire to try and reduce down or in any way depreciate subjective experience by saying um, something along the lines of it happens because of you know, um, these processes in the brain. And, and I think the, the message that can offend people, um, uh, sometimes is, is, and, and this is often the way they would word it when they are offended is that they'll say, you're telling me it's just, Hmm. it's just X, Y, and Z happening in the brain. Um, and I would, I, there's a couple of things to say about that. First of all, I wouldn't be saying it, it's just at all because I recognize that the subjective experience occurs in a domain of, 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 of meaning and a complexity which um, has an existence and reality which is uh, in some sense beyond the brain, not in a metaphysical sense, just in a, in a, in a practical um uh, sense in terms of interactions between people and past and um, and uh, history and such like um, uh, and the other just is that um, why depreciate the wonderful awesome complexity of of an of of the, the, the organ of nature which is the brain and, and particularly the human brain there's no just it's inc- it's amazing you know what a phenomenon it is this system you know we should stand in awe of, of that complexity um, so why should there ever be a just and and also any um, charge of reductionism is one that I would want to um, want to um, uh, defend against because uh, again there would be a may, way of misusing um, uh, some findings about the brain to uh, um, explain a particular subjective experience that might be seen as as reductive. But again, I, I would say that's not my personal approach. So when, for example, I approach brain function, I would, I'm interested in things like emergent phenomena, um, uh, uh, phenomena that arise um, when um, 
certain components are layered up, for example, in a in a hierarchical way uh, with with dynamics. Um, and and then you might look at uh, the system, the brain at a particular level where you're looking at, at large scale distributed networks that are um that are playing out their dynamics over an extended uh, uh, time period. So it's not, I mean, the, the misuse of neuroscience is most flagrant in something like phrenology, mm-hmm. where, and, and cognitive neuroscience was a bit like phrenology for a period, where it was like, you know, and I still read it in a lot of kind of crappy sort of lay neuroscience and misuse of neuroscience even among people who don't like neuroscience, which is always something that's, that's kind of bothered me, that you know, people who don't like the brain and brain accounts often come up with brain accounts for stuff, and they do it really badly. And, and it's just like, look, you know, get, 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 your, get your message straight and your, your position, because they, they'll you know, um, um, uh, do things like neurorealism. But... But, you know, cognitive neuroscience at a certain period would be modular and might say that prefrontal cortex does this, that, and the other, and, and that's why this, that, and the other. And it's like, no, 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 no. It's not. It's not. That's not a good way to describe brain function at all. I mean, that article was just honestly a, a bit of a mess uh, from um, – I could only – I only really have – any familiarity with one of the authors who isn't a neuroscientist um, is a philosopher. And, and it was just like, a, he clearly didn't understand a couple of the, me- the measures and, and also some of the inferences. And, and it just created this like just messy story. And colleagues of mine were like, we've got to respond to this. And, and I was like, please don't engage with this guy because he'll suck you in. And, uh, it, and, you know, um, there'll never be a productive, positive outcome, really. It was just, you're just perpetuating the mess. So just let it, let it exist. But anyway, they were super keen and, and they drew me in and, and we did write something. But uh, um, is it available? Is it, is oh, it our response? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's in, it's in that same Scientific American blog space. Uh, I, I could dig it out. I can't remember what the title is. Oh, uh, you know what? I'll, I'll, I'll make sure to follow up with you about that so that both articles can be yeah, in the show well, notes for people to check out. Yeah, I guess it's that's the fair way. Yeah, and it, I, I didn't write it. It was mostly written by a colleague of mine, um, Anil Seth. Um, I, I edited it and, and put in a couple of um, bits here and there. One of them was to say, look, you know. Again, the charge that's thrown at, at sort of science, um, which bothers me again, is is that it's a belief system, and I, I, that bothers me. I mean, you describe biological psychiatry in quite a nice way, mm-hmm. tighten beliefs and this this position that uh, that you can be specific about psychopathology by specifics in the brain, and absolutely, you know, I I just found myself sort of nodding within to what you were saying, and so. Um, that's why my approach to psychopathology is one which is a hybrid of, of psychological models and, and biological. It's the only way to do it. And the classic hybrid therapy, in my view, is psychedelic therapy because it is biological in some sense. You take a drug, it works in a particular way with a particular pharmacology, but then it, it, it leads to the manifestation of this very rich psychological content that can only really, at this stage at least, and perhaps uh, ever, you know, be tackled um, um, in a satisfactory way from a from a meaning based, mm. you know, hermeneutic kind of um, uh, 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 angle. Um, where do we go? We I need to come back somewhere. There is. Uh, there is. I mean. It, I wonder about it, although I, I was, you know, definitely trying to represent outside criticisms in the question um, it, to present to you. And one of them was that there's a, you know, there is an established belief inside, not science as a belief system so much. I understand science as a, is an approach. Um, yeah, it's a method. Yeah, and, and, and not a belief system. I know some people claim that scientism 
is a distortion of of science and and a belief system. But let's not go there necessarily. the 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 question was something along the lines of there being a, a tightened belief inside of cognitive neuroscience that says the brain creates consciousness. Right. Yeah. See, that's something I can't I can't um, abide with. You know, brain creates consciousness. That doesn't that doesn't sit right with me, and and it's not something that I'd want to argue for or put my name to. Um, but the other extreme, which is one which bothers me at least as much, maybe more, is this kind of, uh, uh, and philosophy isn't my domain, so um, I'm having to go into a space which I'm not an expert in, um, uh, in terms of the terminology of these, these approaches, but is it idealism? Yeah. Or, or this kind of, which I think has some overlaps with a kind of ancient, maybe philosophy that you might find in 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 ancient Hinduism, for example, that there's a, some kind of field field of consciousness into which you know the brain dives somehow and and, and samples from, and that's another extreme because it's saying consciousness exists fundamentally beyond beyond the brain it's like a, some something's kind of field or something and the brain's like a aerial that just taps into it I, I consider that a huge extreme because to my knowledge i've never seen any kind of evidence for that view whatsoever and and again that would be my challenge to a, an idealist that has that view which is give me something you know give me something that's tangible that could that could uh, allow you know, us to scrutinize that view, test it, put a bit of meat on the bone, rather than just leave it in a kind of airy fairy philosophical space that sounds quite nice, but is probably <laughs> always, yeah, probably nonsense. There we go. Right. Um, no, it's in- it's interesting because it, it, you know, it's it's funny because either extreme here, it's like if. Uh, an idealist and i don't i know i know that there's like a there's like an ongoing subtle reference to a to a specific person who's been very public um uh, in in criticizing in criticizing uh psychedelic cognitive neuroscience um and i want to be mindful that i'm not pretending or presenting myself as representing him when i say these things um you know if, if you were to you know have an idealist ask a a you know we'll say a a physicalist brain creates consciousness person it's like you know, well, show, show me, show me that brain creates consciousness, you know, that they'd be like, well, it's right there. There's, you know, all the evidence is obvious. We know that without the brain, there is no conscious experience, um, for a person. All the evidence points towards our experience of consciousness itself being directly linked to the functioning of our brain and thus brain creates consciousness. And from the other direction, it might be something along the lines of, you know, you know, provide me some, you know, some tangible evidence that, that consciousness exists and gives rise to the brain. And it's like, well, that would be impossible because all physical, all physical references are products of consciousness. And the only way to reference it would be through a type of metaphysical discussion on, on, on subjectivity and the experience of reality. Um, so it would be difficult to prove either side. They're sort of based in... These- yeah, I mean, it's the, the second one. I mean, there was this talk of mental gymnastics around the cognitive neuroscience. That's just massive mental gy- gymnastics for me. It's just I can't even fathom really what's 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 meant by that underneath all the all all, all the language. Um, the physicalist view is part of the problem is that it's often framed in this in in this way that we tend to think, which is linear. You know th- that. And, and that there is temporal precedence that this happens here and this happens there. So the way that it, a physicalist view is, is represented, maybe misrepresented, and maybe some people who are physicalists just haven't really thought it through. But they say brain happens here, consciousness happens here, and that I have a problem with, you know. For me, the the relationship between mind and brain is is a circular one, and the causality can move in both directions that experience that that manifests in parallel with uh with brain function can also influence brain function and that it's not you know one comes first the other comes later so that's why there's something about 
brain causes consciousness that that I, I can't put my name to and say mm-hmm. yes that's me I'm a physicalist it's and I, uh, some people could say oh you're just trying to be slippery here but it you know I want to put my name to something right. that uh, that I believe and and um, and I I'm not someone who subscribes to any metaphysics that's clear enough um, but um, but I also see that uh, information is a curious thing. You know, we talked about entropy of being dimensionless. You know, it has no metric. Now, that's kind of curious, and and that you'll find in in um, certain uh, certain thinkers uh, in um, in physics, for example, who might argue that um, information itself is is a fundamental. You know, information being just difference. You know that that a thing can be in two forms, for example. Um, so you know they're a bit of information, um, and there's no there's no you know magic going on there or any meta- metaphysics. It's just a property of the universe. Hmm. Um, it's not even appealing to weird physics as some you know people like to do with like quantum phenomena to try and you know account for weird experience i always find that a bit of a fudge uh you know almost using the the uncertainty the 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 gaps you know to make an inferential leap and read god in the gaps for example Mm. um but i love that uh, phrase (laughs) it's a good one yeah it's uh it's borrowed of course yeah yeah all all the best stuff (laughs) (laughs) right right. um but uh where do we go yeah but but you know and if it's a if you have to name it um Way back, um, I, I became very interested in, uh, and still am, of course, in, in um, uh, um, how one can sort of reconcile psychoanalytic thinking uh, um, about the mind with, with modern neuroscience and how these two can, can mesh uh, and, and talk, these, these two domains. And uh, in an in a interesting book, um, by a chap called Mark Solms, who's been influential in this domain, and 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 somebody else, uh, Oliver Turnbull, um, they write about the philosophy of this this agenda, this undertaking, um, and they come up with this term for their approach, which is one of dual aspect monism. So monism is, is synonymous with materialism, really. Mm. Um, I have, it's a it's. Got an unfortunate connotations materialism because you think of like materi- materialism around like consumerism right, and such right, like. Right, right. Yeah. But uh, let's just say this universe, you know, that's detectable in any way, um, uh, and and then the dual aspect is is um, uh, is that uh, that mind and brain do are at least in in the domain of aspect how we look at them are different sufficiently different that we treat them differently, you know, that we have a hermeneutic, interpretive, uh, um, meaning-based psychological school of thought in psychoanalysis, Uh, and then um, the hard science approach with uh, with neuroscience that looks to measure um, processes, for example. Hmm. So there's your... I, I was going to say, like, uh, I want to, I want to, we've got about 20 so minutes left. Um, okay. and I want to make a public apology to any, um, anyone out there who feels that I misrepresented idealism, uh, in this uh, opportunity to ask you specifically about it. Um, and I want to shift gears a little bit. Uh, and specifically, I want to talk about psilocybin, um, which is a personal favorite of mine from a, you know, a quasi scientific uh, perspective, but really, quite honestly, from a very experiential uh, perspective, having a lot of love for psilocybin, um, and I would, I would really appreciate hearing directly from you what's happening in the brain when, like, straight from administration to full effect to return. What do we know is happening neurobiologically when psilocybin is consumed? Okay, so the first thing is you're you're taking a, a molecule psilocybin, which is a prodrug, 
meaning that once it gets in the body at some stage, and we don't know exactly what stage, it's broken down to another molecule called psilocin. And uh, that's going to get in the brain, whether psilocybin gets in the brain, uh, it's quite likely. Uh, and, and But uh, let's just say psilocybin gets in the brain and then gets chopped chopped into psilocin, it gets metabolized, and we have psilocin uh, 4-hydroxydimethyltryptamine. And then we have a molecule which looks a bit like um, other molecules, other chemicals floating around in the soup that is the uh, the human brain. Um, and uh, that, that the particular um, chemical that it that that it looks like um, is serotonin. Um, and that's a clue already to what it's going to do, this molecule. And it's going to um, substitute for serotonin uh, in some way and in a particular way. So serotonin is a chemical in the body. Most of it's actually outside of the brain. Um, but within the brain, it, um, it plays a very important role in modulating a range of different functions. Consciousness itself uh, serotonin levels and, 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 and serotonin itself are uh, involved in modulating sleep, for example, um, and dream sleep, rapid eye movement sleep. But serotonin also modulates thinking, cognition, and mood. Quite classically, people think of it, especially in relation to mood. Uh, there is a very simple rule, which is serotonin transmission high, mood high, serotonin transmission low, mood low. It's too simple a rule, but there is also quite a lot to it. Um, so anyway, serotonin is this important chemical. It's a, it's a modulator. It's a neuromodulator. It's a particularly complex neuromodulator, arguably more complex than any other. Um, uh, what speaks to that complexity is that um, it, uh, it works on what are called receptors, which are um, which are kind of, uh, they're proteins that sit on functional units in the brain, neurons, brain cells. Um, and and they're, when they're um, activated by a neuromodulator or a neurotransmitter, which just means the chemical coming in, docking in that protein and then changing its conformation, then that initiates a change in the behavior of the host neuron. It'll do something to the cell it might do something like make it more excitable. Um, and serotonin has 14, at, at present counting, different receptors, different locks that, you know, serotonin is the key comes into. Um, and that's unusual in itself. You know, other neuromodulators don't have as many uh, receptors as that. That's, that's a lot. You know, 14 mm -hmm. speaks to a lot of complexity in this system. And um, some of these receptors are, do quite different things from each other. So it's not that serotonin does one thing at all. It's very much this, um, uh, how to describe a, a, a sphinx, I don't know why, but it's, uh, um, it's elusive. It's an, an enigma in terms of the question, what does serotonin do in the brain? Because it seems to do so much. It's mm. so complex. But we know that one of the serotonin receptors is really important to how psychedelics work and, and psilocybin being and psilocin being classic serotonergic psychedelics. It's very relevant here and it's the serotonin 2A receptor. And this is a receptor, receptors being these proteins, sat on neurons, um, that, uh, that are expressed in particular aspects of the human brain um, in the cortex, massively in the cortex. We're weird animals because we have so much cortex that's what sets us apart from other animals just how much cortex that we have especially given our body weight mm. there are other animals that have big brains but they don't have as at all as much cortex as we do relative to our body weight so we're massive like cortically heavy beings um and that's where these receptors are and more than that if you think of of the brain keeping on this hierarchical track, you know, cortex being high, high up, generally speaking, there are hierarchies within cortex, you know, you have the simple, more simple modalities like vision, hearing, your sensory modalities, your motor modalities, but then you have other parts of parts of cortex, which are often distributed 
sort of front and back that do higher level functions, you know, cognition and, and high, especially high level aspects of cognition, uh, like, like imagination, like having a narrative, a personal narrative, a sense of self, again, disproportionately high serotonin 2A receptors in these highest level aspects of brain um, and human brains having, you know, a lot of these high level aspects. So that's, that's, that's kind of the target for psychedelics. Um, if you block these 2A receptors, people don't trip. That's been so thoroughly demonstrated now with a range of different psychedelics, um, uh, uh, humans and animals, using proxies for tripping in animals, you know. Um, so really important, you know, the, the psilocybin comes in, it gets broken down to psilocin, it stimulates, it activates these serotonin 2A receptors, the cells then become more excitable, then everything else follows from those, those fundamentals. If you block that receptor, it's a really kind of grounding principle for the importance of brain mm. in all of this. If you block those res those receptors, you don't transcend to seemingly another dimension where you meet you know, om omniscient <laughs> being seemingly, you know, that doesn't happen. That, that's very grounding, very earthy principle about, uh, about, about these compounds. And so then, you know, we, we have to go up the levels, what happens beyond that. And so exciting um, a cell um, uh, has a couple of implications. What seems to happen with psychedelics is that the excitation happens in a, in a, irregular way it's not that the drug comes in and it's a steady like chuk, 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 you know it, it's it's sort of there's a randomness to it and that that randomness is part of the well problem it's at least part of the picture that's really important because um, it knocks the firing of cells out of sync with the population level activity of of cells so there's a um uh, what's called a spike wave desynchrony. So the spiking of single units aren't happening in synchrony with um, changes in the electrical um, polarity of populations of several hundred, more like thousands of cells um, as they as they as they move in this in this in this wave-like way in terms of their elect electrical potentiality. And so that's what you record when you stick an EEG cap on or, or put someone in an MEG scan. And these so-called brain, brain waves are these uh, oscillations, these fluctuations in the electrical polarity that you're recording from thousands of, of cells underneath your sensor. Um, and, and you're creating through exciting um, uh, a, a cell through stimulating the 2A receptor, a desynchrony essentially between a single unit and a field of, of, of units. And that's a fundamental sort of entropic principle, really, that you've created some disorganization there. Um, and it's probably at that level that something really key is happening functionally, uh, that you're creating a dysregulation of activity. And there is a fundamental excitation. That's why I winced a little bit when you brought up that article which said you there's decreased activity. No, there was decreased blood flow. Um, but, you know, maybe a colleague of mine might have, you know, banged on about shutting off the default mode network. It's don't don't listen to that. <laughs> you know, it's not a shutting off. It's not a deactivation. It's it's more a change in the quality of the activity. It becomes less organized. Mm. Um, uh, so the brain is in some sense excited, but this, it's a it's an irregular kind of ex excitation and you're scrambling the, the quality of the activity, at least in the cortex. And that's a really important principle. And, and you know, looking to the future and, and beyond the entropic brain was one day, I, you know, I'll probably write a paper with that title. Part of the picture here is that um, that only explains so much. You know, if you take the analogy of, of, of kind of chaos in the brain, um, uh, um, and chaos in the mind, you know, a state of subjective uncertainty, your usual assuredness about who you are and, and all the other narratives breaks down and, and, and you can see that mirrored by, by the breakdown of certain 
systems in in the brain like the default mode network but several others as well what 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 accounts for the emergent order you know jung's classic quote in all chaos uh, there's cosmos in all uh, disorder a secret order i love that quote because it's a it's something that speaks to the phenomenology of the psychedelic experience because there is this you know why do we call these mind these compounds mind revealers mm-hmm. if all all you see is is chaos you know and sc- this scrambling this entropic effect what about the emergent order and that's that's a big question mark at this stage i've got some ideas but i don't i don't really have any meat to put on the bone there um it's just a space to point the microscope so to speak well that definitely uh, goes into uh you know a common a common you know just linguistic theme and in myself as well you know part of my own sort of belief a belief system, which feels like a weird thing to say, um, is that there's there's an intelligence present um, with you know for me it's the mushrooms. I don't work with the with the raw psilocybin molecule, but it's like there's an intelligence there that comes alive when when it's when it's present with the with the complexity of the human mind, and that intelligence is is the is the manifestation of the of the subjective experience and how it takes you into different aspects of the self in a way that seemingly enables a type of uh, especially insofar as a psychotherapeutic effect, sort of a, a, a natural reorganization that points directly to relevatory insight about oneself. Um, that directly matches whatever issues you've come into face and leads to, you know, at least the perception of an effective resolution, if not a, a resolution um, in and of itself, which, you know, then is often referred to personally as as the intelligence of that molecule, which seems to be, you know, describing something similar to what you're pointing at here. Yeah. So, um, yes, uh, I mean, uh, all I could say is, you know, within a complex system, to observe a complex system, it would be easy if we're just thinking about the physical, you know, processes and phenomena here, phenomena, phenomena here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, then, uh, you know, you you could watch a complex system and think, wow, it's it's almost like there's an intrinsic intelligence here. You know, if you if you were to, you know, let's say, take the overview effect, looking at the Earth from space and and it's like it's almost as if there's some kind of um it's like a living organism in itself and wow what you know apparent in, in intelligence in in these movements and and the and the and the you know the dance of uh, these natural processes and uh, i i imagine because i don't know but i imagine that that uh, something's going on here that relates to that that and I, and I, the prediction is that the entropic effect is true um at least of the cortex you know that the, there is this scrambling effect on on cortex but what's happening as an implication of that is that you are collapsing a hierarchy which uh, as the basal state had the the highest level explaining away excessively explaining away the rest of the system, you know, uh, you don't you don't need to process everything. Plus, this this will do. You know, kind of reductionist, really. Right, right, right. Yeah, uh, very much compressive. You know, and 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 these are themes that you'll see in Carl Friston's work and and others as well. You know that there's this 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 compressive quality to the brain based on high level assumptions, which are beliefs which kind of in a hand-waving way explain away what's underneath. But what happens under psychedelics, and this is what's sort of theorized really um, based on incomplete data uh, in, in, in this Rebus paper, is that you collapse the hierarchy so that there is less of the um, kind of coverall uh, compressibility or compression that, that happens when you have a very firm hierarchy in place that the top explains away so much of the rest. If you have a more relaxed hierarchy, you're going to have freer talk um, between the other levels of the system. You're also going to have a less, um, well, you're going to have a more anarchic system. You will have processes play out that otherwise wouldn't have been able to or allowed to. Um, 
And so then it becomes a question of capture in a way. Um, how can you, in a kind of opportunistic way, capture some aspects of emergent order um, that you see in, in, in this altered landscape, dynamic landscape of a psychedelic brain? Um, and, and that's a massive challenge, you know, because not only do you, do you need to capture the emergent um, physical energetic processes with brain imaging, for example, um, but you also need to capture the, the, the lived experience and do it in a way that's not going to suppress or kill, you know, the, the phenomena of, of interest. Mm. Um, and, uh, so it's a, a, a massive challenge going forwards, but, uh, um, that's part of the fun really. Yeah. So I got uh, in the, in the nine minutes we got left, I got a, a couple questions. We'll see which ones we can fit in. Um, initially uh, you said, you know, we don't know exactly where, um, you know, psilocybin is dephosphorylated into psilocin in the body. Although initial reports, um, which is up and up until now, I believed we knew to be the case was that a digestive enzyme, <clears throat> excuse me, called alkaline phosphatase facilitated that, and it happened in the gut. But you're administering um, psilocybin through an IV. So yeah. I'm, I'm wondering, I mean, so right away, obviously, the enzyme is not in the stomach, um, yeah. or that's not what is primarily responsible for the dephosphorylation. I'm yeah. curious if you can theorize at all what might be the differences between um, IV administration and oral administration of, of psilocybin. I mean, the first big difference is that uh, is the kinetics, that if you inject psilocybin, people feel it more or less instantaneously. So let's say you push in a bolus uh, um, over, you know, 30 seconds, then by the end of, the, of pushing in that, that 30 seconds of volume of dissolved psilocybin, people are tripping, you know, or they're coming up, you know, and then they're reaching the peak in like, you know, two minutes later or whatever. Um, and uh, that's weird. Um, and, and yeah, so that's suggesting that, that this is probably not something that, that happens initially in the gut. Um, uh, um, yeah, because it's going straight into the blood and then it's getting um, uh, into the brain. Um, and so probably probably but not definitely um psilocybin is getting into the brain and then it gets chopped up in the brain mm. um uh so that that kinetics thing is is a massive difference and then it's, you start to think ah oh, so is psilocin for hydroxy dmt that different to dmt because we do the same with dmt we inject it into the blood and uh, it gets into the brain. People start tripping more or less as you're finishing the 30-second bolus. And then peak effects, you know, two to five minutes. And then coming down, you know, 20, 30 minutes. And, and this, maybe... is, this is the same duration as injecting psilocybin. Yeah, it's very similar. Huh. I mean, you have to give about um, a, an order of magnitude more DMT, curiously, you know, hmm. yes, the DMT experience is incredibly intense and weird, but in terms of potency based on dose, uh, psilocin, psilocybin it is the more potent uh, drug by an order of magnitude. So you, you'd huh. inject two milligrams of, of psilocybin and people would, you know, uh, have their minds blown, so to speak, more or less. So it's pretty intense. Um, and then 20 milligrams is what we give of DMT. So two milligrams psilocybin, 20 milligrams um, uh, DMT. Huh. I mean, it's it, yeah. Whether or not, I mean, this is where the questions around priming come in. Uh, did we have many people reporting entities with psilocybin? Not really. Um, whether that was because of the compound or because of uh, of priming around. DMT is the drug that makes you experience, you know, a sense presence like there's an intelligent entity somewhere. Or, um, but, but you know, Chris Timmerman, a PhD student of mine who's been driving the DMT research, would um, do a better job on this. But He's been on uh, the show, he, actually. Has he? Great. Yeah, yeah he's a great guy. Last year, yeah. Yeah, he would uh, say that entity uh, experiences are 
aren't the rule actually you know mm. a sense of transcending to another reality another space which is as fundamental as this one but also fundamentally other is more the rule you know over mm. half mm. would report that but entity encounters less than less than half i'm not sure the percentage something like 30 percent, i think so you know with with apologies to the listeners who would like me to just like keep digging in on that question specifically and i'm sure you could continue talking about it given the time for a long while um i have another question about oral administration versus uh, intravenous administration um which is that you know one of the one of the common reports of psilocybin and is that there's a body load to it. There's nausea, there's, you know, other body loaded impact. Um, and this question might be a bit poorly formed, but I'm just curious, you know, is there, is there uh, still a report of a body load for people who are experiencing it um, through intravenous administration? And also, you know, on top of that, how about the, you know, you know, what is commonly referred to as the gut brain and the ser- serotonin receptors in the gut, which I, I couldn't find any evidence or reference of there being 5-HD2A receptors in the gut, but there is pretty heavy representation of 5-HD3 and HD4. Is there some sort of influence that psilocybin could be having on the serotonin receptors of the gut through an oral administration? Probably. Probably, yeah. Again, it's the domain that I perhaps should know more about than I do. But um, I, yeah, I could tell you with any confidence uh, about the concentration of 2A in the gut. There probably is some, um, but uh, I don't know. Um, uh, but we do know that, yeah, 90% of the body's serotonin is in the gut. Um, uh, so it's, uh, it's you know, going to be doing things there that are presumably important. Otherwise, why is it all there? Mm-hmm. Um uh granted that might be where it's produced but then it also it's produced it you know into serotonin when in the brain um so um that doesn't really explain things there but um gosh where else were we the body load um might be something to do with mushrooms and mushroom material because we Mm. don't really have people bringing up you know anything that's that body load when we give psilocybin pure psilocybin even even orally even orally right. yeah yeah i mean nausea not not really I, there was a little bit in the depression trial but it was on it was with onset and it was more tied i think it was tied in with the anticipatory anxiety mm-hmm. and in our in our write-up of that um study the uh the editors of the lancet psychiatry were very you know the, there was a lot of because of the stigma and everything there were like, this is looking too good in a way. We want to hear more about side effects. And, you know, so there was a bit of a push to to put in more about side effects. And so I was putting in stuff around the anxiety that maybe wasn't a drug effect. It was just the fact that these are people with high anxiety anyway, mm-hmm. who have been told in, in, in the right kind, I would argue, of preparation that they may experience anxiety and fear. And they start feeling the effects and, and there's, there's, it's, it's that really. So it's, you know, again, speaking to that curious circular causality between body and, and mind and, um, that, that maybe it was a mental thing influencing and creating the anxiety rather than a direct drug effect. Mm. Um, and the injection, yeah, I mean, people report bodily things, uh, like tingling and such like, but it's not not really a sense of nausea and, and issues with gut uh, um, that that you get even with oral uh, psilocybin or, or IV psilocybin. Hmm. Um, do you have time for just one more question? Sure. Yeah. So this is actually something that I just got an email about. Um, as you can imagine, you know, doing what I do, I get a lot of emails from a lot of people with general or specific questions, looking for you know advice or perspective. Um, in regards to psychedelics. And I got a very strange email from somebody who was trying to have a psychedelic experience and was unable and had tried all the classical hallucinogen, the, uh, like basically LSD, DMT, um, psilocybin, had even tried taking uh, harmaline extracts uh, to potentiate psilocybin and has still had no psychoactive effects whatsoever. Um, and was asking me, you know, what I thought might be going on there because generally the advice 
this person is getting from others is, oh, you need to take more. Um, and my my inclination right away was, you know, Stan Groff's research suggested that, you know, some of his patients needed to be given up to 1,500 micrograms before they would, you know, you know break open and mm. then would be able to be given a normal dose to have psychoactive effects, but that I would, you know, I certainly would not advise anyone whatsoever to ever take that amount, even with a sitter. It's, it's far too dangerous and unruly. Um, but then my other consideration, is it possible... And this is my question to you: that this person might have a genetic variation um, on the on the that basically blocks serotonin 5-HT2A um, agonist from affecting brain function. Is that is that possible? Do you know anything about this um, already? Uh, I, I know something about it through the experience of giving a high dose of psilocybin to people in our depression trial, for example and seeing at least in two cases um, uh, a absent psychological response when they should have been tripping balls, so right, to speak, right, you right, know. Right. And, and that, you know, they're not being anything obviously um, uh, um, obvious that could explain it based on something like body weight or um, past use of psychedelics or medication. You know, these are people who we'd asked to come off their medication and presume that they had, or I think in one case wasn't even on any. Um, and in one case was a quite slight, um, quite, quite slim uh, female, young female, with very limited drug uh, experience, even alcohol. She wasn't a, a drinker. Um, and yet they didn't feel anything, even with 25 milligrams of mm. psilocybin, which... Uh, I now realize is, is a huge dose. Um, it's like four, uh, four and a half, four and a half grams. Say, yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I, I used to get that wrong. And then people corrected me and said, you know, I, I think I was saying like two, two and a half or something. And they were like, no, it's, it's a lot more than that. Mm -hmm. Um, but anyway, so we, so we were left there thinking, you know, and it's the usual thing. Oh, let go. You know, it's okay. Just let go. But, uh, that starts to be quite patronizing. For these people. <laughs> like, look, yeah, I yeah. really want to, you know, I've got treatment-resistant depression. I want to feel this, you know, yeah. this, uh, and, uh, um, or so it seemed, you know, and granted defense can be unconscious, but, you know, come on, there reaches a point where you have to think um, it could just really, do, do you keep banging that whole um, psychological drum or do you think maybe something else is going on like some unusual um, metabolism? Um, and so that's where we are now. I, I do think there are these anomalies um, uh, that exist, and and it's my hunch is that it's something biological. Granted, you know, repeating myself a little bit, that it's rare that you're able to say that something is entirely biological or entirely psychological. But let's at least say the what you know the primary aspect of it is that it's it, it's biological and maybe it's 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 genetic and and then some aspect of the serotonin system whether it's the enzymatic breakdown of the drug itself or something to do with the um creation of the of the 2a proteins um uh, and so some genetic component there linked to the um expression of these proteins that need to be stimulated. We just don't know. And, and this is where we are, you know, in some ways it's an ancient science and in some ways it's a very young science, psychedelic science, you know, ancient in the sense of people experimenting with plant-based psychedelics for um, millennia and then young in, in the, the brain science, you know, we're just starting to get a, a you know, just to scratch the surface really. And maybe, picking up some principles, but nothing's ever absolute in, in science. And actually that, that's quite a nice, if it's okay, um, thing, theme, uh, to come full circle mm -hmm. to, which mm -hmm. we started off talking about, you know, the ineffability of a psychedelic experience through language. We only ever have a, an approximation to the thing itself, um, that there's something in the experience that's beyond language. Of course, that's true of everything, you know, that, that language is always an approximation, but also that um, the way the 
mind works and the way the brain works, uh, we are learning, um, maybe we're wrong, but it seems this way, that all we ever have is an approximation mm. to whatever is outside of the system because we experience the world externally and internally through approximations of the world, through models. Models are always wrong. Models are always an approximation to reality, but are never actually reality. And so there's always this divide that, that is, you know, maybe principally impossible, um, impossible to close. And I, I think because of that, if treated right, it's a humbling um, uh, realization for science in that there will never be an account of reality that is in any way absolute. We'll always just have models, approximations to reality that can only just improve, you know, and, and be close, as close as possible to um, a reflection of actual reality. Yeah, whatever that is. Mm, wow. Excellent. Robin, um, Dr. Robin Hakaro Harris, thank you very much for your time today. Um, and for, for, uh, this, uh, this, this great, this great podcast. Um, I have just like so many more questions, like everything you said comes up with a new question, uh, especially around higher dosing and, and like the 40 plus gram range of psilocybin for people. But maybe we will have another opportunity to speak, um, in the future for the listeners, um, where can they learn more about what you're doing? And is there anywhere you could point them that would, um, that would enable them to support any of the research that's going on in your lab right now? Oh, uh, well, uh, the simplest thing is just to follow us. You know, Twitter is, is the most uh, sort of up-to-date thing. New papers, I, I'll either um, post uh, on my own Twitter uh, page, um, I can't remember all my Twitter. I'll, tag. I'll get I'll get those handles and I'll put them in the cool, show the notes. Hands, yeah, that's it. Yeah. And and the other one is so the group Imperial PRG. I think that's simple at Imperial underscore PRG. I think uh, that's you know as a group that's where we put out um, uh, new publications and uh, and and update people on when we might be talking. You know, different people in the group. Um, and that's probably the best way because, uh, you know, we've got a website um, through Imperial, but it doesn't get updated as regularly as, as Twitter. That's the plus with Twitter, isn't it? It's rapid. Mm -hmm. um, and then supporting us, um, it's difficult because there's a lot of demand, you know, to try and join the team or to be a volunteer in the research. Um, and in a way, just being interested, I think, is supporting the, the broader cause, Um I think there's a lot of people who are indirectly supporting us and don't realize that they're already even, you know, listening to this podcast, for example, it's just uh, so much interest and excitement. I, I consider that um, support, you know, keep asking the questions, the critical questions that supports, you know. So I don't think there's anything more concrete, really. Um, uh, I flirted with the idea of a charity at one point, you know, because uh, the bottom line is. Uh, um, research needs funding, but I went off that idea, and and there's uh, other ways of of raising philanthropic support, which is more um, more efficient, which seems to be starting to work for us. Um, um, and one day we'll break the uh, the mainstream funders, and and they'll start supporting this. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, no, the future looks very bright, and yeah, just. Keep uh, keep listening and reading and and being critical. Yeah, excellent. So uh, for the listeners, the links uh, to the Twitter handles will be on jameswjesso.com for the show notes to this episode, um, as well as the articles that we we discussed earlier. And uh, Robin, thank you so much for uh, giving us so much of your time today. Um, I really appreciate it. Thank you. It's a pleasure. I really enjoyed it and cut well that does it for this episode of adventures through the mind i appreciate that you stuck around for the whole interview i hope you appreciated the interview itself 
Uh, if you did, you could throw some money in my direction. Um, although I might live kind of far from you, uh, so it might be more reasonable to use the internet rather than you know just your right arm or left if you're you know uh, southpaw. But uh, you can do so by heading to jameswjesso.com forward slash support, and there's options for PayPal donations, crypto donations, or by um, becoming my patron on Patreon, which would be super great because it gives me a you know a reasonably consistent sense of what my you know regular income for this podcast will be, so that I can appropriately assess my investments, um, so as to ensure that this podcast continues to grow and develop um and i do so in a way that cares for my own boundary boundaries and and longevity as a as a working creative entrepreneur so much appreciated you could also buy some t-shirts or some blotter art uh and you can also follow me on social media at james w gesso on um, facebook instagram and twitter uh, i got a new uh instagram uh at mind podcast attm ind podcast you follow me there mostly memeing memeing pretty hard on there and then putting commentary uh into the memes so it's not just not just recreational enjoyment of uh drug oriented memeing uh but you know hopefully some interesting thoughts to uh, contemplate there too oh and of course the reddit yes yes the subreddit check us out on the subreddit too also at mind podcast uh where you could discuss this interview um, and the topics around it. Join the Patreon community, my patron community there, um, as well as the sort of larger community of people who are participating with the content. I don't know, can you hear my belly rumbling? I've been all up on the mate all day today. Basically, intermittent fast plus mate. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much for tuning in, and uh, I will see you on the next episode of Adventures Through the Mind. Take care.